Hello everyone and welcome to today's webcast. Smartphone security is getting stronger. Are your forensic methods getting weaker? My name is Trevor and I will be moderating this webcast. Today's featured speaker is Heather Mahalik. She's leading the forensics effort with Ocean's Edge, Ocean's Edge excuse me, and she is the course lead for 585. Before I turn things over to her, the Q&A portion will take place at the end of the webcast. Please feel free to submit your questions at any point by using the questions window. Right now, I'd like to turn things over to Heather. Thank you, Trevor. Hopefully, my voice is loud enough for everyone. If not, please just let me know, and I can adjust accordingly. Um, I intend to leave questions at the end. Again, if we run tight on the schedule, my contact information is on the beginning of the slides here and also at the end. And you can feel free to reach out to me at any point with any questions that you have as we go along. So this presentation is essentially talking about what we're dealing with now in forensics when it comes to smartphone forensics. The security on these devices keeps growing. The ways that the users can protect their devices and keep us out forensically is also getting stronger. So we're going to take a look at one, what are the hurdles that are presented to us, and then two, how can we overcome them? And all of this is a glimpse of what we teach in 585, and we go in depth during that course. So uh, the agenda. Um, I'll do a brief two slides about myself and about 585. Then we're actually going to look at what's happening in the smartphones. It's preventing us from having the access that we used to, what you should do about it, and then we'll talk about some tricks to outsmart your tools and the current methods that exist. Like Trevor said, I, am, um, I work with Ocean's Edge, and we focus on mobile forensics and other interesting things. If you're interested in what I do in my regular job, my work email address is also at the end, so I'd be happy to talk with you more on that if you're looking at other vectors and options to get into mobile devices. I've been doing forensics for 12 plus years. The last six have been focused strictly on mobile devices. I co-author 585, which is Advanced Smartphone Forensics, as well as 518, the Mac Forensics with Sarah Edwards. I am the co-author of Practical Mobile Forensics, and I am all over social media if you need to find me. So 585 was officially launched in 2014. It is a new course, according to SANS. In my mind, I feel like it's been around forever already. Yes, we are working on a cert for the course, but it is not available yet. I wrote this course with Lee Krugnelli and Cindy Murphy, and our goal was to keep it as current as possible, deal with the biggest issues as possible, keep it completely vendor neutral. So we are not pushing one tool on you, and where possible, we use open source tools. We try to cover all aspects of smartphone forensics in six days. So yes, it's a lot to cover, but we really narrow down on assuming that most people can get an acquisition, and we are teaching you the methods to pull everything out of your analysis. Okay, so for this presentation, taking a look at what's actually happen happening in smartphone security and how is it affecting us. So full disk encryption, it is now readily available. Um, more people are using it. The some devices require it. We'll talk about that in a few slides. When Lollipop was announced, it was saying that Google said it would be forced out of the box, full disk encryption. And now they are taking back that statement and saying it's going to be strongly recommended. So we don't know what to expect as users start buying Lollipop devices, whether or not they're going to enable full disk encryption or not. But regardless, it does make forensics difficult. It makes our acquisition difficult, and it makes analysis very frustrating if you get a full binary image and everything's encrypted. Passwords. Passwords are encouraged on all devices. Um, now when you buy a device, one of the first prompts is to set up a password, and you can ignore that. However, I find most people actually use passwords. And then we'll talk about one of the more interesting topics that I'm excited to talk with you about during this webcast, and that's application security and what that means for us, because most people are using third-party apps. So what does this mean for you? As an examiner or an IT professional or anyone that's looking at mobile devices, you need to be prepared for all situations. 
you need to be prepared for all three hurdles that we're going to talk about. So a person could have full disk encryption. Even if you get past that, you may have applications that are fully encrypted that you may have to attempt to get past that. The other issue is the state of every mobile device could be different. So a simple firmware update, um, an application version update, how the user is protecting their data can change everything in your method. So you need to be flexible and as knowledgeable as possible. You cannot use just one tool to do smartphone forensics. Anyone that tells you you can is probably trying to sell you that one tool. So make sure, even if you don't have a big budget, there are ways around this. I have done several presentations that are available on my website on doing smartphone forensics on a budget. So there are open source solutions out there. And the reality of it is you are going to have to manually carve forensic, or forensic artifacts. You cannot expect your tool to spit out everything that's on that device with the press of a button. It just will not happen. There is not a find evidence button in smartphone forensics. Believe me, I, I wish there was. I've spent many, many hours over the last six years manually carving data, and I hope that some of the work I've put in will ease your effort and make things a little easier for you. But the reality is that you may be 100% blocked from the device. Um, no one ever wants to hear that. When I have students in 585 and questions pop up on specific devices, sometimes if it is locked based upon how the device is protecting that user data, you may be 100% blocked. So what should you do? Obviously our ultimate goal is to get the password, to be able to get into the device and extract all the data so we have the complete picture for forensic analysis. The first thing you should do is one, consider the issue and make sure you know the issue. Make sure you don't have someone that is warning you, hey, I have this encrypted device, I'm going to bring it into you for examination. What does that mean to them? A simple swipe could be encryption to some people, but it's not. So is it a user lock or is it actual encryption? What I strongly recommend is get all the information about the device before you actually see it. So get the make and model, um, try to find out what OS is running on that device, what the user uses it for. So is it a corporate device or is it their personal device? If it's corporate, they may also have MDM running on the device. They could also have that on their personal. So just make sure you're aware of this and also be prepared for lack of parsing support. So even if you get past the encryption, you get a full physical um, acquisition dump, you may have to manually carve through that data. Another thing to consider, remember all tools are not created equally. You may have a ton of commercial tools that cost you almost $100,000 for smartphone forensics, and that's fantastic. However, they will not give you all the solutions. You are still going to have to reach out to other options that are available in the open source community and possibly even write your own scripts or utilize scripts that have been developed by others in the community. Once you know your device and you know which tools you have, determine your plan and make sure this plan does not involve destroying your evidence. I have that in red at the bottom because it can happen. If you or someone else in your lab guesses the password multiple times, you could disable that device, you could wipe the device, and render the user data completely inaccessible because different wipes overwrite different things on the device. Um, another thought, if you think you're going to get root access on an Android, for example, there are some devices that if you gain root after user data is on the device, you could completely overwrite that data partition. So you need to be aware of your actions and that they could harm your evidence. Very, very important for you to learn that. So now we're going to go through and break down each of the problems, and then we're going to look at the solutions. So our problems. Um, most of the smart devices now offer some form of full disk encryption. iOS, very strong now. Um, iOS 8 is very difficult for us to bypass, but there are ways around it that we will discuss later in this presentation. Um, starting with the iPhone, the iPhone 4S, things changed. So the encryption levels changed. Um, our methods for bypassing and injecting boot ROM on the device, that was taken away. So Apple really locked down this device for us forensically. We do have workarounds. Um, I will address some of those in the rest of this presentation. 
and others are discussed greatly in 585, and some are discussed in my book as well. With Android, so again, Lollipop, it was rumored that full disk encryption would be forced for everybody. Now they're saying that's not true. One good thing to keep in mind is Android users, for some reason, don't update their devices as frequently as iOS users do. So for the bulk of the community, running an Android 4 version, and they have not upgraded to 5, Google is saying it could take up to two years before we see all those people running Gingerbread, KitKat, and so on to actually make their way to Lollipop. So keep that in mind that we may not see this for a bit, but we could. So if you see it, I honestly have not seen full disk encryption enabled yet on a Lollipop device to know what to expect. Um, for anyone that's out there that's a previous 585 student, when this does come out, it will be in the protected section of my website for you to access. For everyone else, I'm sure I'll do another webcast when I actually see this and if we find a way around it. Windows 8, um, they're in addition to full disk encryption, they're also incorporating BitLocker technology. If you are interested in the Windows Phone 8 and Bypass, there is a reference at the end of this for Cindy Murphy wrote a paper with others in the community on an entire Windows Phone 8 investigation and everyone in the community really pitched in to help her solve this case. It's a great paper, it's on Sans Reading Room, it's also on my website, it's all over Twitter, so I'm sure you can find it if you Google Cindy Murphy Windows Phone 8. And then BlackBerry, very, very difficult device, um, hardware level encryption. If a BlackBerry device is locked, it is difficult to bypass it. There are methods around it that you can use, um, but honestly, it's luck of the draw. BlackBerry is used by corporations known for being secure, and it is still a very secure device. Um, one little shameless plug here, if anyone is interested in access methods around um, getting jailbreak access, root access on some of these devices, side loading applications. That is covered in SEC 575, which was um, authored by Josh Wright. It's mobile device, mobile device security and ethical hacking. So it's a great course if you're interested in vectors into the device versus forensically examining them after the fact. So that was our first problem, our full disk encryption. Our next problem, user locks. Um, if I could have all of you raise your hand, which you don't need to hit the little thing raising your hand, but I bet almost none of us that are listening right now have a mobile device that we do not have a lock enabled on. It is uncommon to come across these devices now. My parents even lock their mobile phones because I've taught them that they need to. The most common are the PIN or the simple passcodes, and these are the most um, easy to bypass. So. If you consider a four-digit PIN, most of the tools now offer a method for bypassing that. However, it's not possible on all devices depending on where the key is stored. The passphrase or complex passcode gets a little bit more difficult to bypass, but it still is possible, and I'm going to show you that later in this presentation. For biometric locks, what I mean here are the fingerprint scans or the facial scans offered by the devices. Some of the facial recognition they've upped the ante a little bit on how secure they are. So now instead of just being able to look at a picture of your face, they actually have to see movement and the eye blinking and such. If anyone has seen the YouTube video of a detective successfully acquiring an Android device by using a picture of the suspect and using the Celebrate UFED, that has been out there. And I think the blinking of the eye is are supposed to prevent something like that, but you never know. And again, the fingerprint is just a pin behind that fingerprint. So obtaining access is getting more difficult, but our old tricks still work sometimes. There are new solutions to support the tricks that aren't as readily available. Our third problem, and this, um, this slide is more for your awareness. Yes, it's a problem. So third-party apps use their own protection. And I'm calling it protection here because People say encoding and encryption and use it interchangeably often, and that's not the case. The apps also do false advertisement on this. So one thing I want to point out to you here is there is a major difference in an encoded payload and an encrypted payload or application. Most of the encryption that um, we've seen on mobile devices is AES. That's by default by the hardware level to the application level, but there are others that are possible. 
The encoding schemas, we love when it's ASCII and Unicode and it's very, very easy to read. One thing that some of these apps are doing that they claim that they are um, self-destructing or encrypted, they're actually just using multiple layers of Base64 encoding. The forensic tools do not always parse this data. This is going to be included in your solution section today, so you will see how to overcome this problem. But one thing you need to keep in mind as well is all applications are not created equally. The developers can control how the data is protected. And another thing to consider is different versions may have different levels of protection. For example, if you're using Facebook and you're using this current version and your data is just encoded, you may upgrade and your data is now encrypted. That data is stored in the same database file. So as an examiner, when you start sifting through that data and carving it, it could get frustrating if you have 500 items to go through. So it's very important that you understand which ones are base64 versus which ones are encrypted. OK, so now we know our three problems. Now it's time for us to look at our tools and our methods on how we're actually going to overcome all of these hurdles that are presented to us now. So our solutions. I won't lie, full disk encryption is going to be the most difficult for us to overcome. So first and foremost, can you disable it? Are you able, do you know the user's password? If you do, can you go in and turn off full disk encryption? If you can't, if you can acquire that device while it's live, then the data is live and it should be readable. So these are things you have to consider. Um, can your tool bypass it if the device is turned off and you don't know the passcode? So is there a method for you to custom or create a custom ROM to flash to that Android device or to interject before it fully boots up so that the encryption is not always enabled unless it's the hardware level. And that's what we're dealing with with BlackBerry and iOS. So if it is truly tied to the hardware, then this will be an issue for you as well. Um, JTAG and chip off, again, may not work on those devices because even if you pull the data off, you're now going to have a big chunk of encrypted data that you still cannot decrypt. Something else to consider, depending on the method of encryption, can you bypass it after the fact? So is there a way for you to attempt to decrypt it? Again, your success rate is going to be very low here, most likely. But if the first three bullets fail, and you cannot, and that device is full disk encryption, you do not know the passcode, you cannot get in, what about the SD card, and what about the SIM card? You should look at both of these, acquire both in a forensically sound method and manner, and then examine them, because it's often third-party application data that uses SQLite, which most of them do, will store a bulk of the data out on the SD card. You may also find preference files or dictionary files or passwords out on these devices. So don't, don't lose all faith in your investigation just because you hit a major roadblock. Really think outside of the box. And we have a whole slide on thinking about cloud and inside the box and what that actually means. So we'll hit that in a few slides here. User locks. Um, I was going to use some colorful wording here and decided against it, so I just changed it to break that lock. Do not let a user lock stop you. There are free solutions out there. There are cheap solutions that can bypass these locks. Leverage the cracking tools. And then we're going to talk smart locks, too. So in the screenshots here, on the bottom left, I'm actually showing IP box. And this is a screenshot courtesy of Cindy Murphy. She actually went ahead and wrote an entire user guide for everyone on how to actually use the IP box to crack iPhones. I will show you that in a screen coming up. Um, top right screen, this is via Extract CE. Um, Andrew Hogue released this tool, and it's free for the community. The CE means Community Edition. And you can see here that you can use the Android Gesture Key Removal to go in and remove locked Android files. You can remove them from the device, acquire the device, and put them back on. And finally, the one at the bottom, Andriller. This is one of my new favorites. You can see here that with the lock screens, you're able to decode passwords, crack pins, crack passwords, brute force. Um, and not only are you able to do it, it tells you how to do it. It tells you exactly which file you need to grab from the device 
in order to do this. So very, very nice tool. Um, he does offer this tool for free for law enforcement. So if you are in law enforcement, you can Google and driller and contact him directly or feel free to reach out to me and I can help you get a free license from him if you're law enforcement. You do need to have a law enforcement email address in order to get this tool. For the smart locks, so smart locks is a new term introduced with Android Lollipop. And what it is, is the user can elect that the, if they are in a trusted area. So for example, if I pull into my driveway every day and my phone hits my Wi-Fi, or it knows GPS-wise where I am, my device could permanently be unlocked. What this means is also, so you could trust GPS locations, Wi-Fi hotspots, as well as near field communications. So if the user trusts and their device is in a trusted area, it will be unlocked and you should be able to forensically access that device if you're in that same location. So think about this in regards to a search warrant or even if you can somehow spoof that Wi-Fi hotspot and be where that device is, if the smart lock is enabled, it may help us forensically. And again, this is one of those things that has piqued my interest. I have not spent the time yet to actually dig into this to see if you're fully um, available to access all the data on the device or if it protects anything. So I will look into that and I will be pushing out information as I find it. This is the IP box. Um, it was built for cracking iOS devices. You can buy this directly from China um, if that makes you uncomfortable. Teal Tech sells it. That's where I received mine from. It does support all iOS versions. This means iOS 8. It is supported. Um, it will work even if the iPhone is in a disabled state. I have managed to put my iPhone in a disabled state several times while working with the IP box, and it bounces back. It is fine. One clause, though, it may wipe a device if the user sets the device to wipe after 10 unsuccessful attempts. Of all the people I've talked to in the community, this has only happened to one person so far. But it is possible, so use caution. Bill Teal warns everyone in his site to use caution. Cindy does the same thing in her paper, which is listed in my references. Another thing to consider, this is a Chinese manufactured box. Um, it will make calls out to websites that are located in China. So keep in mind that if you are using the IP box, you may want to use it on a machine that is not networked, but just also know where it came from and consider that if that's a major part of your concern on where boxes like this, these flasher boxes, they're obviously pulling data and reaching out somewhere. So just keep that tucked away in the back of your mind. But again, it's a great way to access a locked iOS device that otherwise you would be getting no data out of. Another thing to consider about locked devices, what about the lockdown file? So you can actually use the lockdown file if the user had backed up to iTunes on their device or connected their device to their host computer. Um, again, it may not always work, but it's worth a shot. So what you see here in my screenshots, this is an example of my lockdown folder on the left hand side and you can see there it's Heather's MacBook Pro and then I navigate out to the lockdown folder. The lockdown folder will only exist if a device was synced to that computer. Something else to keep in mind, you will see multiple plist files here. Each of those plist files are unique to a device. Um, I have synced multiple devices because I was building 585. These aren't all my personal devices but you will see they are all tied to various devices. The screenshot on the right is Physical Analyzer. What I'm attempting to do here is get a file system dump, which is, in my opinion, the next best thing to a physical dump, of a locked iOS device. And you can see in the screenshot it's saying the iOS device is locked or untrusted. So what I'm doing is pulling my plist files from that lockdown folder on the hard drive and importing them one by one into Physical Analyzer to see if it unlocks. I just demoed this live in my class last week and it works. It works on my iPhone running iOS 8 and it's locked and we are completely able to bypass it without the trust pair being on that computer. And Driller, 
this is also something that is covered in 585, and you actually have a lab on this. So here, Andreller is used. Um, what I've done is I went out and I removed the gesture key and the password key and the settings file required to bypass the passcodes on Android devices. One thing to keep in mind, these devices will have all the files available to set the passcode. If there's zero bytes in size, they probably were never used or not enabled by the user. I recommend if you are accessing the device and pulling files off to try to crack a password, grab everything and then just sort through which ones you actually need. In this example here, I'm cracking the gesture key. And you can see it's um, lab data, lab five, gesture key is the file we're pointing at. It's added in. It's a hash, a salted hash value. Not only does the tool tell you the pattern, but it also draws the swipe code for you so that there is no question in your mind what the password is. Um, some people would ask, if you can physically acquire the data and get the file, why would you even need the passcode? And honestly, if you have looked at raw data or a physical acquisition of these smartphones, they are now equivalent to a hard drive. There are so many files. Getting logical access is the best thing you can do. It's kind of your cheat sheet for where to dive and dig in your investigation. So I strongly recommend unlocking the device, getting a logical acquisition to supplement your physical acquisition. Also, if it were a newer device, so say this was a device that actually had full disk encryption on it, you could possibly go in and disable the encryption. You could get other acquisitions because you know the passcode on the device. And Driller is not shown later for parsing the third-party apps, but if you go into the decoders file, you will actually see that in decoders, there is a great amount of support for the newer third-party apps, and all you need is the raw database file. You throw it in here, and it decodes the data for you. So again, it's a great tool to use in addition to your other tools for examining third-party apps and bypassing locked devices. Application encryption is one of my favorite um, areas right now to deal with because how it's advertised is really entertaining to see what it really is and how it's really stored. So the primary question here is, is it even really encrypted? And I'm going to give you a good glimpse of 585 and these slides coming up here. Application data is forensically interesting because it varies upon version. It varies upon iOS devices or Android. Windows, BlackBerry, whatever you're running it on, it seems to be stored differently and act a little differently. Um, what I strongly recommend is use a tool to view the file system. So what I'm using here is iFunbox, and I have my device connected, and it does require that you do the trust pair, which I'm going to talk about in a slide coming up here. What's the trust pair mean? So for iOS 7 and later, your device must be trusted by the computer as well as the phone in order to communicate with one another. Once it does that, I'm able to view my file system here. I can export any files I want. So if I go into user applications or app file sharing, I can actually export the files. I could put those into another tool like in Driller. I could use a SQLite browser to look at them, a hex viewer to carve for raw data. So again, it's almost like the entire file system is at your fingertips, and you can just pluck and pull what you need to examine. So export your files of interest, and then manually carve for the artifacts. If you load most of these tools, or these files, into the commercial forensic tools, it will not parse the data. You have to learn how to look at this data and how to determine, is it encrypted, or is it encoded, and can I really get nothing from it? So it's very, very important that you understand these concepts. You also have to think outside of the box a little bit. So if you are concerned about Facebook and you cannot get access to the Facebook files, it either wasn't pulled through the acquisition or the data is encrypted. Other ways you could possibly find traces to Facebook. If you consider application, or application sharing and permissions, a great example is Instagram, which is used for file sharing of photos and videos. If you looked at a simple backup file of my iPhone, which is locked, is protected, if you look at my Facebook, you're going to get nothing. So 
how the data is pulled, you may just see that Facebook exists. I do not have it set to send me email messages or notifications through SMS, so you won't get that trace, and a lot of people see that traffic. But what you will get, if you look at the preference file for Instagram, you would see that I allow Instagram to share pictures to my Twitter and to my Facebook. So now you have my Facebook username, my Twitter username, and if you're lucky, depending on the device and your acquisition method, you may also get the password. So now you have actual login information for Facebook. Now this doesn't mean that you can just go out and log in to the user's Facebook account and pull down their data. You would clearly need to have consent to do that. So make sure you don't think I'm telling you to go out there, get everyone's passwords, and log into their information because I am definitely not stating that. So let's look at some of these self-destructing apps. This is one of my favorites, and this is pulled from, um, this is one of your glimpses of 585. Cyberdust is used for secure communication. Um, it's essentially like the Snapchat of text messaging. You can send pictures as well. They claim to remove all user data upon transmission and receipt. If you look at Cyberdust, it claims that it's very, very secure, and there are no traces left behind. What we hope that this shows you in these next few slides is that you should never, ever trust your tool because you're going to be smarter than your tool. And that is the goal of advanced smartphone forensics, is to make you smarter than your tool and teach you how to manually review all these files for user activity. In this example here, we're actually using iBackupBot, which is a free tool to look at a backup file or a live connected device. Um, here is Cyberdust, and you can see within that you'll have the document and the library and other directories. In the library caches, we can see some write-ahead logs. So these WAL and SHM, these are write-ahead logs for that cache database file. Yes, the cache database file is encrypted. So Cyberdust is not lying to you when they say that that data is encrypted. However, we found when examining these write-ahead logs and the SHM files that there is data in there that can completely be decoded. Um, one thing to keep in mind is when you are sending a message, it gets cached somewhere before it writes to the database. And that's what these write-ahead logs, these journal files, and these SHM files are. So they hold a lot of evidence. The forensic tools will not parse this information for you. Currently, I don't believe any of the forensic tools are parsing Cyberdust by default. So now let's look at what's actually in here. And this is where it's a little alarming. So if you use Cyberdust, you might want to dump your own device and take a look at this. We are looking at the write-ahead log for the cache database file. And what's highlighted in blue here, we can see a username, Calvin Cakes. We can see a date and time on when the message was sent. We can see down here, if you look, you can see the room ID, so where the conversation was occurring, account ID, and then it's cached. So here, it says, what's up, my boy? Right here, it says encrypted message. This message is not encrypted. If you actually go into that cache database file, you may find that some of those messages are truly not encrypted. What it is, is double base 64 encoded. So here you can see we've pulled out that string, which we'll call the payload information, starting with VJ here. We put it into a free online Base64 decoder and got that output. And then once we have that Base64 output, we double decoded it, and you can see it says, what's up, my boy? So here's the perfect example when something claims to be encrypted and it's truly just encoded. Now I will tell you, the forensic tools are not doing this for you. This is a method you would learn in 585 on getting past hurdles like this with application data because most people are using these now to communicate. Another clue here, so if you saw the payload information from this first output, the ends in the equal side, um, base64 encoding often uses equal signs to pad at the end because they must be divisible and equal to 30 in the end, so if they're not, that's why you see that information. But just know, just because it says it's encrypted, don't trust what the application is telling you. Don't trust that the tool is telling you that you're blocked. Be smarter than all of it and go in yourself and try to manually dig it out. 
Okay, so what happens when your device is truly not supported? And by this I mean your forensic toolkits won't even support it if it is unlocked. Um, your methodologies that you have in your lab will not support the device. JTAG is a great solution. So JTAG is one, you can destroy the device if you don't know what you're doing. I personally have taken Teal Technologies JTAG class and it's a five-day course, and I learned from Bob Elder how to do JTAG forensics. From there, you get a raw binary image that you have to learn how to parse the data. So I was able to take my JTAG class and tie it with 585 and get the total picture on how to handle the data once you get that raw binary image. One thing to note is this may be your only option for some devices, whether they are locked or not. So don't assume just because the device is unlocked, you're going to be able to hook it up to your toolkit and acquire data. That is not always the case. A good example of that is the Windows Phony. And now Celebrite is adding in some, or some support for it, but Cindy's paper goes into the JTAG methods used to actually access this data. Again, practice makes perfect on this. Um, there are some great wiki pages out there on JTAG because one, you have to know how to take apart a phone, you have to know how to use a soldering iron, and you have to know how to use a RIF box, which is a flasher box to essentially read the data. It may require some mobile device repair because the device must be able to power on in order to pull the data off. However, I will say that JTAG, you can get an entire JTAG solution for probably under $1,000 easily and be successful at it as long as you practice. If you do take the JTAG course that's offered by Teal Tech, they do provide you with the kit you need to do JTAG forensics, but again, it's totally up to you. What I don't recommend is getting a device that you have as a piece of evidence and doing JTAG on it if you haven't done it in a while because you will get rusty and you could harm the device. If you're looking for um, more information on these data ports, and how to actually solder to the taps on the device. The Forensics Wiki is a great one, and the links for that are on my website, smarterforensics.com, so you can check it out, or you can reach out to me, and I can put you in touch with the people who are maintaining that site. Okay, so have you exhausted all options? What else can you do? So you are, full disk encryption is blocking you or the user password is set in a way that you cannot bypass it, or you can't get access to any of their applications because they're all truly encrypted, or your acquisition method did not pull those off. So now we're going to try to think outside the box, or as I have it worded here, inside the box and the cloud. So how essentially can files that exist on the host computer or out on the cloud help you with your mobile device that's in front of you. Here is a picture of my screen. So this is me connecting my iPhone to a computer and it's saying, do you want to trust this computer? If I say don't trust, the computer cannot communicate with my device. I must click trust in order for that trust pair to continue. Now a few things to keep in mind here. Once a device is trusted by the computer, it remembers that it was trusted. So if you have access to that host computer and you have to assume that the user has connected it and trusted it at some point, you may be able to access that pairing record to get access to the device. One thing I want to warn you about is if the user restarts their device, it won't work because when you refresh your device, you may have to pair again. If the user wipes their device, the trust pair record is also removed from that device. So keep in mind if it's wiped or restarted, this may not work. And limited data may be recovered. What I'm not telling you to do is get access to the host computer, install all your forensic programs on it, and acquire the device. I'm telling you to simply look at that host computer hard drive, take the methods you've learned in other classes, pull off the files you need to see if you can trick a trust pairing on your forensic station with the mobile device. What about backup files? Backup files, honestly, if you cannot get into a mobile device, 
most people back up their data. If you can get access to their backup file, you may get almost current information. Most users also back up their apps. The issue is iTunes won't always store the third-party apps. You may have to access iCloud regardless. You have to make sure that you have authority to do that. So there are forensic methods out there that will acquire the phone in such a state that it recovers usernames and passwords. Just because you recovered those does not give you legal authority or consent to reach out and capture iCloud information. So make sure it's crystal clear if you have access to networked or cloud storage. Also, network storage being essentially the host computer with iTunes. Once you have it, examine the backup file for forensic evidence. What I strongly recommend is examine every single backup file, pull out the dictionaries, and see if you can recover the passcode by looking at their dictionary files of what was cached on the device. For example, iOS. The user dictionary file on iOS will cache 644 characters in every language the user types in across all applications. So not only will you get fragments of user activity, but you may also get passwords that were entered. So it's a great, great way to craft passwords, and I'm going to show you that in some screens coming up. And again, if you can find the passcode for the backup file, and if you can crack that backup file, it most certainly could be the same password that they're using on the device. We use passwords repeatedly. Um, I'm in this field, and I know what it's like, and I would be lying to you if I said I did not use the same username and password on multiple applications across multiple devices. So again, creatures of habit, habits will hurt them forensically but help us get access to their device. But before we look at cracking these backup files, we have to understand how Apple is protecting them. So this is specific for iOS backup files. And this is another glimpse of 585. So when an iOS backup file is created, the keychain is created and prepped to capture the data. The user has two options. They can choose to encrypt their backup or they can choose to not encrypt. When the user selects to encrypt their backup, they are prompted to enter a password. This password could be as easy as 0000. It could be as complex as a statement. So keep that in mind. The user is encrypting it. So what Apple does is it grabs, it encrypts their data, but it grabs that password and it includes it in the keychain, which is available for us to crack forensically. This is fantastic for us. This is really good news because cracking these backup files is a pretty simple process. We are still very successful at this, whether it's an iCloud backup or an iTunes backup. The issue is Apple protects users. So if the user chooses not to encrypt, they just do a backup, the keychain is not captured and saved with the backup at all. This means that when we open their backup file, Yes, we can see their data, but we are not going to see certain applications. We will never get usernames and passwords, and we will never get access to their email because Apple's protecting it. So again, Apple protects the user from themselves. The user could actually hurt themselves by choosing encrypt and setting a password. And this is why. So this is Elcomsoft password recovery, and here I'm showing you the options. So you can choose to try to crack an iOS backup file or BlackBerry. You see multiple options for BlackBerry. So strong support for BlackBerry as well. Um, here, I'm going to choose iOS backup file. The next screen, what happens, and I'm not showing you all the screens because, again, this is just a webcast. It's a glimpse at what occurs. But your options are to choose brute force or dictionary. You can import files. You can create your own password dictionary files to run against it, but you'll get two things that will happen here. Either the top screenshot will say password wasn't recovered, and you can choose to use other attacks, or like the bottom here, you'll see it says recovery results, and it shows the password. Now the reason this is starred like this is because I was trying the demo version. So what this is showing you here is if you have a locked backup file, it is worth downloading Elcomsoft, trying the free demo, and running it against your device, because as long as your demo lasts 30 days, if you can crack that password in 30 days, 
you know it works, it's worth your purchase. I personally think this is a very valuable tool, so I would recommend it regardless, but it just goes to show you could try a demo to see if it works. In this instance here, I did load a dictionary file. You'll see it has a capital letter and a lowercase. It also has numbers and um, other characters at the end. Using the default brute force will not be able to crack that. It's usually either or, so you can say uppercase only, lowercase only, but it does not do a good job at both. However, in this example here, this is actually an iPod, or this is an iPad. I used the dictionary file off an iPod Touch, threw it in there, and it cracked it. This password was cracked within 10 minutes. So it can work very well. So what do you need to know to have success with secure mobile devices and all the hurdles that are faced and presented to us now. One, you have to learn how to handle locked and encrypted devices. You have to ha learn how to understand the difference. And is a device encrypted or is it just a user lock? Or does the user lock actually enable encryption on the device? You need to learn how to bypass security features. Um, this is something that those of us in smartphone forensics and developing courses, we are always aiming to find ways around this. Tool developers, the same. It is so important that you learn how to decode and manually carve data because your tool is not going to do it for you. You must understand the different operating systems and their file system formats. It is very, very important that you don't just get stuck in learning how to press a button on a tool to get the answers. Um, again, if you want to learn how to handle data this way and to this level. That's what 585 was built for. It's designed for everyone from people trying to learn how, sorry, I went too fast. It's designed for people learning how to protect devices as well as forensically acquire devices for those new to the field, for those who have been doing smartphone forensics for 10 years. We have designed this to please everyone in the class. Everyone will walk away with someone or something not someone, if you haven't even acquired a device that is addressed, instructors are willing to stay before and after and assist you, tools will be provided to assist you as well as phones. So don't get intimidated by thinking that it will be too advanced for you. There is no pre prerequisite. Um, we will spend the time getting you up to speed, but we will make sure that you walk away armed and ready to deal with your next smartphone. So some references for you here. Um, obviously, you got some of the material from 585. Practical Mobile Forensics, if you're on a budget, this book that I co-wrote with um, two other authors, we tried to focus 99% on open source solutions. So again, if you have a tight budget, you may want to check that out. And Driller is listed here. And again, if you are law enforcement and you want a free license, please contact him directly or contact me and I can help you get in touch with him. Cindy's paper on the IP box is listed here as well as her Windows Phone 8 security. Both great reads, both great reference papers. Um, I would print those out and keep those for future work. The JTAG Forensics Wiki here, this links to Teal Tech and I recommend the JTAG Repair as well. That's where I learned how to do JTAG Forensics. Before we get to questions, um, 585 is offered on demand and VLive. If you're not aware of on demand, you actually get free Beats headphones. It's essentially self-study. You get four months to take the course. That means you also get licenses for all the smartphone tools that we use in the class for four months. And you get four months ongoing access to the on demand help as well as myself. Um, I am teaching in Orlando in April and it's actually discounted through 318, which I believe is Wednesday. So if you sign up between now and 318, you will get the discounted rate. After that, it goes up to full price. Um, Cindy and I are both teaching in May, and then it's offered at Sandfire in June. Cindy's teaching in August, and V Live. So if you want to listen to me in the evenings for six weeks, two nights a week, it's actually fun. You can relax, be in your comfy clothes, and we get through the course. 
I often have people say, well, I get the same experience if I take it on demand, VLive, or in the classroom setting, and absolutely you will. All demos, everything that is shown live to students, you will not miss if you take this class on demand or VLive. So it's all recorded. Um, the instructors are all set up to show you anything remotely that they could in person. So don't let that deter you. So at this point, I will take any questions. And I also want to point out my website, Smarter Forensics, at the bottom. Um, I do post any free tools and presentations and white papers from others in the community, as well as a lot of my own research. If you are government, military, or law enforcement, and you're interested in more of what Ocean's Edge can do to assist you with mobile access or getting information over the air, please reach out to me. My work address is at the bottom there. Trevor, I'll hand it back to you now for questions if we have time. Oh, yeah, we do have time. Uh, thank you for handing, me, handing that back to me. I've got a few questions here. Um, the first one is, what is the name of the iTool that you used in this webcast? Um, iFunbox. It's I-F-U-N-B-O-X, and it is free. I meant to include that in the resources. I forgot to actually write that. I will type it in for everybody just so you can see. All right, and while you're doing that, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, get to the next question here. The next question is, I was told that due to a recent iOS change, the plist file will only work if the device has not been powered down since the sync. This would make it or this would make it necessary to keep a seized iOS device powered up until it is examined. Is that correct? That is correct for the trust pairing. And to be honest, I thought that was also correct for the plist. And I proved, I warned all my students last week when I was teaching that this would fail on my device, and it worked. And I had just gotten done restarting my device. I had to do the retrust, and it actually worked. So it's worth a shot. I would always say, you never know. If you are locked out of the a device, try every possible way to get into it. So don't trust, again, what people are claiming, because it may shock you. You may actually get into it. OK, thank you for that. And uh, we, the next question, it looks like, iPhone is now using fingerprints. Can you address that for uh, getting into a smartphone? Sure. Um, so the fingerprint? is essentially just a simple way to bypass the pin for the user of the device. Um, I've had people say that they're going to try to replicate thumbprints or hold the person down and make them press their finger to their device, and that's actually not good enough. If you want to communicate with that device, you need the pin that is backing up that fingerprint. So all fingerprints are set up with a pin in the background just in case something happens. If, what if you burn your finger and your thumbprint is damaged? So you will also notice with the thumbprint, if you touch it several times, the passcode prompt comes up, and then you have to enter your passcode to get in. You also have to enter your passcode the first time after a reboot, as well as an update. So it's really just a simple passcode on that device. So as long as you can bypass that, you're in. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, next question. This subject is very interesting to me. What can an IT professional do with 585? Once they complete the course, if they have no InfoSec, forensic experience, is it enough to obtain a career? Um, I would say that what you'll learn in 585 and the people you will meet would be a great foot in the door if you're interested in the branching in forensics. But I have InfoSec um, IT professionals all the time who take 585. Um, I've had several students who have taken both 575 and 585, and so they feel that they have the total picture of mobile device security and forensics from taking both. But I would honestly say the networking opportunities and the ability to work in teams with people will really get your foot in the door because you never know who is in that classroom looking for someone else as well with IT experience. Okay, uh, next question. Does IP box with the $100 extension cable work on iOS 8? Yes, and it's required that you buy that cable now. And I should have brought that up, so that's a fantastic question. 
Um, when I got the IP box, Teal Tech wasn't selling that extra cable that is required for iOS 8. Um, they do sell it now, uh, so you can get that. It is half the price of the box, though, which you just mentioned. It's $100, and that is required for iOS 8. Okay, uh, next question. What is the name of the tool to have uh, RAW access to iOS? Can you repeat that, Trevor? What is the name of the tool to have raw access to iOS? Um, raw physical access? There's multiple tools out there. Are you referencing one that I was showing the file system on? We'll wait for them to, while okay, they're uh, so entering I'm not sure if they're talking no. about acquisition access or what I showed in that screenshot. Oh, no problem. I'll. Uh, if you get it, uh, whoever asked that question, if you just enter that in the questions box, we appreciate it. Uh, while we're waiting for that, I'll ask the next question. The next question is, is there a certification attached for Forensics 585? We are working on it. Um, I believe someone from the certificate or GX certification is sitting in on my class in Orlando in April. So fingers are crossed, that all goes well, and if it does, then we will be working toward a cert for this class because it is definitely needed. It will be the only vendor neutral certification offered in our community right now. Great. Uh, next question. Have you tested Soft's Windows Phone backup download capability? That's a fantastic question, and I haven't because I have not come across a Windows Phone backup nor have I come across a user that elects to back up their Windows device, but it is offered. And on that same note, um, if you come across a Windows phone and you have a backup, IEF by Magnet, their mobile option does support Windows devices as well. Great. Uh, next question. For an enterprise architect, what do you consider the most secure mobile solution? Oh, geez. This is a hard one. BlackBerry. <laughs> Honestly, BlackBerry is still the hardest. If, if I could dread one device that comes across my desk, it would still be a BlackBerry device. Okay. Uh, next question. Have you heard of the MFC dongle? And if so, how does it compare to the IP box? Um, I have heard of it, and I personally have not tested that. I had a few detectives in my class last week that they said they have damaged some devices using that dongle, and they haven't had any success with it yet, but personally, I have not tried it. Um, for whoever asked that question, if you also want to reach out to Cindy Murphy, I can get you her information, and I'm sure that she would provide you information if she's looked at it. Okay, and regarding the question earlier about the tool you're using, uh, the person said yes, so I assume he means the tool you're using inside, uh, on, on the webcast in your slide. Okay, it was iFunbox. And then the one with CyberDust was iBackupBot. And I'm posting both of these in there for you. Okay, and next question, which versions of iOS 8 can be accessed via IP box with the cable, such as uh, 8.00, yeah. 8.1, etc.? So they are advertising all, but I think 8.2 just came out two days ago, so I don't know if that one's supported yet. I have not tried it, but they're claiming their methodologies will support all iOS versions. It does work on 8.1 but I have not tested it on 8.2. I assume it will because the only thing that really changed in 8.2 was adding support for Apple Watch. Okay, and um, somebody was requesting Cindy Murphy's uh, contact information um, for, for the question uh, earlier. And what, we'll do, we got one time for one more question, so I'll go ahead and uh, continue with that. Is, there are any current way other than JTAG to acquire a Windows phone? Yes. Um, Celebrate, the UFED now has support for it. Um, with great thanks to Cindy for sharing out the Nokia 520 information. So they are adding support. But right now they are the first 
forensic tool offering acquisition support. So it's either going to be manual examination, the UFED, or JTAG. Great. Thank you. With that, it looks like we're uh, out of time, so I would like to say thank you so much to our featured speaker, Heather, for her great presentation and for bringing this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in today. For a schedule of all upcoming and archive webcasts, visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.